So what was it about? What did we learn in the last session actually? So in the last session, we were learning about the coronary angiography basics. So now we all, I think you all should be having a bit idea what is done during the coronary angiography? What are the things which we do? What happens in the cath lab, isn't it? So we had already described what are the different views which is being used. What are the different types of ways to describe a lesion as well? What is being used for doing the coronary angiography? How do we start describing as well? So in the lesion description, I think we had already spoken about the arrangement of lesions, about the contours, like the smooth, is it irregular, or whether it is ulcerations. Ulcerations, as I said it, what it means is with small craters, like small, you know, if there are craters, if you can see, with uh, discrete luminal widening in the area of stenosis. So you must always speak about the arrangement of lesions. Is it tandem lesion, sequential lesion? What about the contour, the calcification, and also the thrombus? So how do you comment about the calcification? How many of you guys have seen the coronary angiographies? Or at least the reports or the CD actually. They would have written, right, the calcification. So it can be again none, mild, moderate, severe. So mild when you see it, because only if you see it only after the contrast injection. So it is then it is called as mild. Moderate will be when the densities are noted only with the cardiac motion, but prior to contrast injection. Similarly, it is called as severe when the radio opacities are noted without cardiac motion and prior to the contrast injection. So similarly for the thrombus, regarding the thrombus, you tell it in terms of two ways. Either it can be discrete, otherwise contrast staining. So it will be discrete when intraluminal filling defect is noted with defined borders and is largely separated from the adjacent wall. Similarly, you call it about the contrast staining when, when you know if it is, it may be present or not. Then further, going further about the lesion set, you also comment about how about the you know the tortuosity, tortuosity of the vessel, and you t tell it in terms of accessibility, accessibility because if it is more than seventy five degree bends, how many number of them is present? Is it mild? So mild means only one bend. Moderate will be up to two bends. Severe is more than three bends. And then you also comment about the lesion angulation. Angulation again, similarly, if it is located on a straight segment or a bend less than 45 degrees, it will be called as none or mild. Moderate will be 45 degrees to 90 degree bend. And it will be called a severe bend when the angulation is more than 90 degrees. And then you have to start commenting about the osteal lesion. For example, osteal is the proximal lesion set. So you comment it like this. If the origin of the lesion is more than, less than 3 millimeter of the vessel origin, you comment it as aorto-osteal. When it is close to the aortic junction, you will say it as branch osteal. When it is uh, giving rise to a major epicardial artery like LED or diagonal osteum, obtuse marginal osteum, PDA and posterolateral osteal. I think you would have heard about CTO. CTO, does anyone remember what is CTO? CTO lesions. CTO lesions refer to chronic total occlusion. Chronic total occlusion is based on the Timmy flow. What is Timmy flow? Anyone should tell me what is the full form? Uh, 
Wonderful. Anba Alagan. Wonderful. Wonderful. That's what Timmy actually stands for. So in that, you try to see whenever you inject a contrast, you try to see how much of amount of the, you know, the you can see the flow. So in that, if either there is completely occlusion, that's when you will no, not see any flow at all or maybe even one. Otherwise, and this flow has been seen for duration of more than three months. And yes, you may also get an indirect hint about the clinical history. For example, if a patient has had some myocardial infarction or acute onset as well, then you can say it like this. But not all chronic total occlusions can be reopened. Some of them may not be able to be opened. And how do you say that? For example, it may be divided further. The chronic total occlusion can be divided into favorable, non-favorable. Favorable when there is a tapered stump. Tapered stump means one stump is kind of, you know, a little bit extension is there in the minor branch. Similarly, in pre or post branch occlusion. So after giving a branch, if there is occlusion. Otherwise, there is a functional occlusion. Functional occlusion means it may not really be occluded. So, you know, one may think of occlusion may be present. Similarly, bridging collaterals are absent. Bridging collaterals, what is bridging actually? Does anyone remember what is bridging? So one question is, a lot of times, yeah? Right, right. Most of the times, bridging happens between, uh, yeah, like this as well, but uh, some there is a phenomenon, a lot of times you may come across a patient with chest pain. And what happens is you have done the TMT, normal, negative. And then later on, sometimes when you do a CT angiography, so you, you may also see bridging. So what happens in that, there is no coronary artery disease, but there is a connection connecting coronary artery between the epicardial and the endocardial one. So what will happen is, whenever the, during the systole, Whenever the heart contracts, there will be pressure on that myocardial bridging between the epicardial and endocardial one. And it will be pressing on that blood flow. And that is when the patient is going to have the chest pain. So that is what is called as the bridging coronary artery as well. So now since you know the favorable outcome anatomy, there are also coronary artery anatomies which can be unfavorable on which... Uh, it may be very, very difficult to do, uh, you know, to get a good uh, occlusion. For example, if there is, uh, ab stump is absent, otherwise occlusion at the side branch, otherwise total occlusion is there, otherwise bridging collaterals are there as well. So collaterals, the concept of collaterals is very important. Why? Because... Even if one side is occluded, one vessel may be occluded, but if there is good collaterals, so then what, will, what is going to happen is from the other side, blood may flow to that segment reversely. So collaterals also one should be able to describe. And collaterals, how do you see them? In which view do you see them? And between what to what vessels do you see them? So that's also important. So as you can see in this is RAO LC. Okay. Similarly, this is an LAO LC. Left circumflex LAO. L in LAO LC injection, this is how you see these collaterals as well. So this is the reason I always say it like this. A single view is never enough. You must be able to get multiple views. And that's how it becomes better and you can see them in, a, in the best way possible. So what is happening in this collateral channels in the LED occlusion? So as you, you may see it over here, so these are the views which is taken. The RAO, in this view is taken in the RAO and RC injection is done. 
and then you can visualize these collaterals. Further in the RAOLC injection, you visualize these collaterals, isn't it? So this is how you visualize them. And then it comes to the collateral channels in the LCX occlusion. So in the different views, you visualize the different types of collaterals and these collaterals, they have a big role. So even if the vessel may be occluded 100%, but yes, if they are good, well-developed collaterals, there's no need for stenting or even bypass. So that's why it is very, very important on the what kind of collaterals are there between what vessels as well. This is very important, okay? So now uh, you all would have already heard that some of those bifurcation lesions are very difficult for doing the stenting. So what do you do? How do you do that? How do you approach them? So there are different methods of classification, something like a Safian classification. So they can further be classified into type 1, 2, 3, 4. So for example, type 1, as you may see it over here, they are again divided into A and B types. In the type 1, if it is parent vessel stenosis, proximal and distal to the bifurcation. So there is proximal and also distal to the bifurcation, okay? And then it is called as type 2 when the parent vessel stenosis is proximal, only proximal to the bifurcation. It is type 3 when the parent vessel stenosis is distal to the bifurcation. However, in type 4, what happens is the parent vessel is normal, but Osteo side branch stenosis is seen as you may see in this lesion set actually. So the another there are further more classifications as well which can be utilized. As you may see, does anyone remember about the Duke classification? Try to look in this. Hello, Dr. Narendra. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Doctor, your voice is breaking, doctor. Okay, just a second. Students just a are able to hear clearly. Students, are you able to hear clearly? Dr. Narendra? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, can you hear me now well? Uh, we are able to hear, doctor, but your voice is breaking now. Just a second. Let me just uh, try to reconfigure. See, everyone is telling yes. Just a second. Hello? Hello? Can you guys hear me now? Okay, wonderful, wonderful. So what I was telling was about the Duke classification. So I think you all have heard about Duke classification or not? So I, I hope you all are able to see the figures which is over here. So these figures are the different types of uh, the classification. Uh, so it is type A, type B, type C, type D, E and F. So rather than earlier was about the numbers. So which was 1, 2, 3, 4. Okay, so now it has been 
alphabetically divided into A, B, C, D and E, F types. Okay. So why this numbering is done is because you are trying to see the different types of the blockages and you want to specify them as well. So that because if someone has given a report like this is where the blockage is there then how they should be able to proceed they should be able to get an idea of the lesion set and then they can plan the intervention isn't it so this is another such classification as well which you can see so again it has been classified into different types 1 2 3 4 4a and 4b and then the last one the another classification is called as medina classification in that you name it in the basis of numbers 111 110 101, 011, 100, 010 and 001 classification, okay? So, uh, what is the main goal of coronary angiography is you are trying to say which lesion set is dangerous, which is not so dangerous. So, this is already a chart which is there in front of you. So, but I would like you to say as well, what are the additional factors? You all should use the chat box and classify. So, what are the additional risk factors in which you call it as low risk factor or high risk factor? Anyone would like to try it out here? So I will give you guys, uh, I will also just need a just five minutes break I need. So in the meantime, you can try to discuss about the how much is the risk for the patient? How much is the problems for that patient? And by seeing the uh, your coronary angiography report as well, you should be able to further say, is it a low risk patient, moderate or high risk in fact, okay? So for the low risk, if it is discrete lesion, concentric, readily accessible, non-angulated, smooth contour, or little or no calcification is seen, and then just leave, leave it with me. Okay, I'll do it later. And then, for example, what when it comes to the moderate risk, the lesion set will be tubular, eccentric. If it is moderately tortuous moderately angulated, otherwise irregular contour, or otherwise the total occlusions are less than three months, or osteal in location, or even if some thrombus is present. Similarly, the patient is going to be high risk when there is extreme angulation, more than 90% is present, otherwise CTO is more than three months old, there are bridging collaterals, Otherwise, inability to protect major side branches. So, when you come to the standard classification, so now we know the, some of the personal descriptions and all, like uh, the Duke's classification and the others as well, but there are some standard ways of classifying as well, which is accepted by the American College of Cardiology, like the type A, type B1, B2 and type C. So in type A, when there is very low risk, in the type B1, the lesion is there only with one moderate risk. And for type B2, when there is two or more moderate risk. Similarly, type C, when the lesion has at least one high risk. So this is how you see, for example, how, because we all also need to accept one of the biggest problems with coronary angiogram is it is more of a luminogram. Luminogram means why? You are only able to visualize the lumen. For example, what is the difference between the above diagram and the lo lower diagram? In the lower diagram what happens is it also shows the diffuse narrowing and there is more of a focal narrowing in the first one. So from the angiography only, you may see or think the first diagram is much more difficult. It's a very difficult patient or, you know, a worse prognosis compared to the second one. But it's not true. The second 
patient needs much more attention and lot many more interventions compared to the first one. So how can you solve it actually? So if you want to uh, come across or do away with the limitation of the coronary angiography, how will you do that? How will you go away? So what will you do is for this, you, you must be able to take multiple projections with different angles. And as I said it, you need to also know how much is the normal caliber of the major coronaries. For example, for the left main, it is bigger. LED is a little bit still. LCX is a little bit smaller. And RC is even more smaller. And then you may also use further things for your help. What are those further things? They include IVUS examination. And IVUS means intravascular ultrasound. And then comes the functional study. Functional study refers to CFR and FFR. So what is FFR? Functional flow reserve. Exactly, exactly. So I'm trying to show you some more images. So what will happen is the way the plane in which a vessel is being examined also can give a false uh, impression. In the sense, if you see a vessel in this way, in plane A, so one may think, oh, this is only 10% stenosis. However, if you see this vessel in another projection, one may say, no, this is 75% stenosis, isn't it? And the same problem we are trying to show you in different figures wise. So how the different lesions may look like. So that is one of the reasons why coronary angiography is not the real foolproof method if you want to visualize. And that's why it is called as a luminogram. You are able to visualize only the lumens. And what happens? Yeah, the problem always is when there is inadequate number of projections, the injection which is in track of the contrast material is not so good. When you have super selected injections, and when there is some catheter induced coronary spasm as well. And otherwise, of course, if there is a patient with congenital variations of the coronary origin and distribution, myocardial bridging may be there. Otherwise, if you have induced what is called as accordion effect. Accordion effect, what is it? Accordion effect is wire induced spasm. So that is one of the reasons a lot of times in some of the imaging modalities, CT angiography can be preferred. So what do we notice in this is uh, RC is originating from the left main coronary artery. If we see it carefully, but you know, um, the fluoroscopy imaging can be a little bit causing confusion. And similarly, what happens in this picture is later on when the when a follow-up angiogram was done for a patient, it was seen what you notice clearly is the RCA is originating from the LED. Now coming to the FFR. FFR is a big boon, I would say, for the medical field, especially for the people who are working in this, uh, interested in the coronary angiography and about the problems. So what is FFR is, it, the measurement involves determining between the maximum achievable blood flow in a diseased coronary artery and theoretical maximum flow in a normal coronary artery. An FFR of 1 is widely accepted as normal. However, if the FFR is less than 0 0.75 to 0 0.8, it is generally said to be associated with myocardial ischemia. And as I had said it, it is measured routinely during the routine coronary angiography with a pressure wire. To calculate the ratio between the coronary pressure distal to the coronary artery stenosis and aortic pressure under mm -hmm. conditions of maximum myocardial hyperemia. And this ratio represents the potential decrease in coronary flow 
distal to the coronary stenosis. However, the ability of the cardiologist to discriminate between lesions that can cause MI and lesions that are physically or physiologically insignificant on the basis of coronary angiography alone is limited. So FFR also has its own limitation. So uh, the FFR although gives a straightforward, readily available quantitative technique for evaluating the physiologic significance of a coronary stenosis. So for example, if there is a coronary stenosis, how much is it affecting the blood flow? And that's what we are interested in, right? And there are also risks also which can happen to the FFR procedure. Uh, you know, for that you may need additional contrast to use, radiation exposure, or even there is a slightly increased risk of coronary artery dissection with the FFR wire passage itself. So you also need to be a little bit careful, not just, you know, go take the pressure wire and just, okay, let's do the FFR. Similarly, to measure the FFR, the operator crosses the coronary stenosis with the FFR-specific guide wire, which is designed to record the coronary artery pressure distal to the stenosis. And the pressure transducer is located approximately 20 mm. So there should be a distance of at least 20 mm proximal to the distal tip of the wire, so that it can be seen fluoroscopically. And once the transducer is distal to the stenosis, a hyperemic stimulus is administered by the injection through the guide catheter. And the FFR is monitored for a significant change. To achieve maximum hyperemia, adenosine is typically used and for which you can uh, use like 50 to 30 microgram bolus uh, uh, for like typically RCA, otherwise 20 to 40 microgram for a left coronary artery. Otherwise even intravenous infusion can be given at the rate of 140 microgram per kg per minute for 3 to 4 minutes. So to summarize, if you directly get a FFR value, which has been given after the procedure, if you want to know, if it is more than 0 0.8, it means there is a stenosis, but it is not hemodynamically significant. Similarly, if it is less than 0 0.75, it means it's a hemodynamically significant stenosis. Okay. Can I speak to you after half an hour? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So, and if the value is between 0.75 to 0.8, the values are indeterminate and should be considered in the context of the patient's clinical history to determine if the revascularization is necessary. So you should be, I, I would expect everyone, all of you to know these values because if it is less than 0 0.75, if it is more than 0 0.8 or between 0 0.75 to 0.8 so that what are you planning? Are you planning for revascularization? Revascularization, of course, it can be always be in terms of stenting or it can be in terms of bypass surgery as well. So that's, that's all for today. Any questions do you guys have so far? Hello? Sir, what is small weapon disease? Sorry, what? Please type your questions, small no, weapon. because a lot of times I do have those noise and all keeps on coming. Can you type your question? Please, please yeah. I would request everyone to use the chat box. So, yeah, you can write it in the chat box. What is your question? Because I can see it very well.
Ah, small vessel disease. Small vessel disease is actually a condition in which, you know, the small arteries of the heart are damaged. Small arteries means, so for example, you know, rather than these big vessels, when these uh, small vessels disease are damaged, and then this condition may also cause signs and symptoms of a heart disease, something like an angina. So, uh, small vessel disease can is also called as coronary microvascular disease, actually. So, it generally refers to the small vessels, actually, of the heart. And, yeah, this thing can also happen even in the brain side as well. In the brain side, so, for example, if someone has had uh, neurological problems and all, secondary to that, yes, so it basically refers to the branches. Any more questions? Although it is more common in women, otherwise people who have diabetes actually. But can be a little bit more difficult to disease actually. And yes, even when the angiography and all has been done and then in those big vessels you do not see anything. So it can be a bit difficult even to diagnose. Contrast medium selection. I, I didn't understand. Uh, Sir, actually we are using some contrast for uh, angiography. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, sir, um, how to select the contrast? Sir? Sometimes the special contrast and sometimes they are not using, they are using ordinary contrast. So if what is happening, no, if someone is very symptomatic, if someone is really symptomatic, uh, I mean if someone has contrast allergy, so those are the times you can try to see for some uh, special contrasts. Otherwise, if a patient is fine, no renal problems and all, then you can think as well. So depending upon the patient's allergy history, if patient's uh, uh, renal functions as well, you can try to see for that. Sir, is there any contraindication for angiography? Uh, sorry? Uh, yes, uh, contra uh, angiography, a lot of times, it, if, it, if it happens like this, is if someone is you know allergic to the contrast, if someone has uh, coagulopathy, you know, someone has very high bleeding tendency, someone has, uh, so for those kind of conditions, you have to be really careful. Otherwise, when you can see uh, those plaques, soft plaques are there, plenty of plaques are there, you know, in the aorta or in the left main, a very unstable patient as well. If the patient is really unstable in the sense, like very fragile, so... Those are kind of, you know, relative contraindications, I would say. And yes, you said it, triple vessel disease, cardiologists prefer PCI over ca cabbage. So, for example, if, uh, yeah, because bypass surgery is always a bit painful experience. And, you know, stenting, you just do it. Next day, patient can walk and do whatever he likes as well. So That is one of the benefits, no doubt about it. And then, so that is why, as I said it, so what you do is, uh, any of these triple vessel disease in which the stent can be put up in an easy way. So that is the time stenting is preferred over bypass. Otherwise, if someone is uh, a diabetic, for example, if it is a triple vessel disease, you should ideally prefer bypass surgery. Because if someone is having extensive dyslipidemia as well. So those are the conditions of familial dyslipidemia. Or earlier prior history of stent thrombosis. Those are some of the conditions in which you should prefer cabbage surgery.
Any more questions? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chaudhary and Anbalagan. Any more questions? Sir, one small doubt. Yeah, yeah, please, please write, uh, t tell me, tell me. Sir, what is the amount of weight you think that uh, you can order while the time of uh, it's angiogram and angioplasty? It will always depend upon your duration. So if you are able to do an angiography in five minutes, you know, of course, your duration is much less radiation going to be much less <clears throat> but if you do your angiography in one hour of course it is going to be much much more right so it is when we were covered with the leg press means it won't be uh, it, 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 it will be safe now sir you mean for the cardiologist sir um, we are also going now sir that's why I am sparing that's what I am asking no, no, I didn't understand your question. Actually, you are wearing that uh, lead apron. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Uh, um, for an angioplasty, if it is taking some, or some half an hour to one hour, uh, whether it can produce any effect to it? Oh, see, lead apron is said to be very, very safe. In fact, and that is one of the reasons why we all wear that, actually. But the, what happens is... Uh, we also, so what happens is it depends upon the thickness of the lead apron, first of all. Yeah, most of them is uh, meant to protect us from the radiations. We all need to understand, for example, if the lead apron is uh, 0.5 millimeter. In fact, then only uh, like 40% of the radiations which is going to come is going to be, you know, scattered. So similarly, so that is why it's a big uh, difference as well. Like how much thickness of a radiation shield are you using it? And then what happens is like, you know, how are you exposing yourself as well? And then in the sense, one of the other important questions is, for example, how much is the distance you are maintaining? Not just the lead apron. So for example, from the source of radiation, you know, from there as well, how far are you standing? Are you using any other, you know, uh, lead uh, curtains are there as well? Not just lead aprons. Other than that, there are something is called as suits are there nowadays, uh, lead suits. So just to pre prevent you as well. So on those things as well, it helps quite a lot. So ideally, one should use it actually. And it, it does help basically. But it will depend upon the thickness of the apron which you are using how much distance you are using for how long do you use and even as i said those uh, uh, the curtains as i said it so i always try to put it up those extra things as well yes thank yeah. you yeah yeah well thank you thank you no problem so most of the times yes uh, if you're using those good quality ones 99 percent you can really reduce but in a good way so even yeah those quality also it makes a big difference which you are using and uh, those days are gone i would say like in which we are trying to protect only our uh, thorax and the lower i mean the hip region uh, nowadays there is a lot of al already issues as well in which we should try to protect our uh, collar region as well and in fact there are some studies which has been showing that uh, interventional cardiologists or any of 